Welcome to the Garden Talk Podcast, where we interview growers from all over the world, both beginners and experts, seeking to learn more about what they know about gardening and how they do things in their garden. What's up, everybody? For you that don't know me, my name is Chris, aka Mr. Grow It, and you're tuned into the Garden Talk Podcast. This is episode number 119. In this episode, I interview Stephen Raisner, but many of you know him as Potent Ponics. He has been on the podcast once before, episode 64. We talked all about aquaponics. While I got him back on the podcast, this time he talks about growing genetics the best way possible in your climate. Stephen has grown in several states across the U.S. and several countries around the world, so he has a lot of experience growing in different climates. And he reveals a lot of great information that relates to this topic. If you want to see highlights of these Garden Talk podcast episodes, search Garden Talk Clips on YouTube. That channel is dedicated to short, bite-sized clips of these episodes. I also have a gardening channel where I have over 130 videos showing the plants that are in my garden. I'll have that channel linked in the YouTube description section below. One of my goals for this podcast is to bring free information about gardening to the general public. That being said, I'd like to thank the sponsors of today's episode who helped make that goal possible. Thanks to AC Infinity for sponsoring this episode. Check out their all-in-one pH pen, which measures pH, EC, TDS, and temperature. The sensor probe is replaceable, and it comes with storage solution and calibration solutions. Click the link in the description section below so you can learn more about their all-in-one pH pen, and the discount code MrGrowIt15 works on both Amazon and their website, acinfinity.com. Happy Hydro. They have some of the best complete beginner grow kits on the market today. Their kits include a grow tent, grow light, ventilation system, grow pots, soil, nutrients, and more. They have 36 different kits in their beginner category and also have advanced kits, cheap kits, and kits that include an auto watering system. Go to happyhydro.com, link in the description, and use the discount code MrGrow during checkout to save on your order. Stash Blend. I've been using Stash Blend for over a year now and it's awesome. One of the things that I really like is that it saves me money. It's a whole bunch of different inputs in one. So I no longer have to go out there and buy a silica bottle, then a separate seaweed bottle, beneficial bacteria, then a separate one for mycorrhizal fungi. All of that plus more is in this one blend. Go to stashblend.com to learn more about it. And I also have a link down in the YouTube description section below. And we're back. Welcome to the Garden Talk podcast. Today, I am joined with Stephen Raisner. How are you doing today? Yeah, thanks for having me back. Yeah, thanks for coming back. We did one episode in the past, so some of you might remember that one. He goes by Potent Ponics. And last episode, we talked all about aquaponics, which isn't a very popular growing method, but you can definitely grow some really good plants that way. But this time, we're going to switch things around. Really going to talk a lot about genetic diversity. And growing genetics the best way possible for your climate. You know, there's so many differences that can happen. You have so much experience growing around the world, really. You've been grown in different countries. So I think it's going to be a really good conversation with you to kind of reveal some information, tips, tricks, and so on and so forth. But before we get too deep into the episode, can you introduce yourself for the audience members who don't know you? Sure. My name is Steve. Uh, I have a company called Potent Ponics. Uh, I also have a podcast called Growing with Fishes. Um, we've been around now for eight years, um, so we've been making a lot of awesome content, uh, similar to yourself, with uh, a lot of you know similar similar type uh, structures. But um, my main uh, work is uh, doing consulting for uh, all different types of living soil and aquaponic systems and farms uh, all around the world with a variety of crops. Uh, the majority of it being medicinal uh, plants or essential oil producing plants, as, and then the rest of it being food production crops, mainly organic certified for the for the aquaponics. Um, there isn't a lot of people that can come in and, and set up those types of facilities or troubleshoot them when they run into auditing problems. Uh, so we do a lot of internal audits. Uh, and um, mainly lately, the last five years or so, going to different countries and setting up large facilities, um, specking out the equipment, specking out the systems, the pumps, the filtration, you know, has, you know, setting up the different SOPs and all the different protocols and coming up with different solutions, especially in, in oddball places. And I'm sure we'll get into some of them in a little bit. Uh, uh, you know, learning different things in different cultures. And, you know, it seems like every part of the world has like a different piece of the puzzle really figured out like to the umpteenth degree. And uh, it's always fun to um, learn from these different indigenous cultures uh, uh, and kind of combine all that knowledge into a, a working system. Got it. So like what countries have you grown in or areas have you grown in? Maybe I know the might be quite a long list here. Maybe just spitball off a handful of them. Sure, yeah. So I've grown in Canada, 
all across the U.S., Puerto Rico, Jamaica, um, Zimbabwe, South Africa, Thailand, um, Colombia, um, and I'm sure I'm forgetting some. Oh, oh St. Vincent. And I've been to Grows in Swaziland or East Swatini now, uh, as well as, I'm sure I'm forgetting somewhere, but uh, quite, oh, Laos. I've seen some Grows in Laos as well. Matt, all over the place. That, that's wild. All right, so let's first get into genetic diversity. Break it down for us. What is meant by genetic diversity? Sure. So genetic diversity is kind of what is the different phenotypic expressions of the different plants in a given region. Um, so, but also in mutations as well. You have things like freak show, um, uh, ABC, um, and, and uh, crow's foot. There's a bunch of other ones as well that can be genetic variation. But uh, mainly what we're, we're going to talk about today is kind of the differences between the different land races. Uh, and the different stuff that was in, you know, different regions. Um, Jamaica, for instance, had very few, it was almost no land race left by the time I was there in 2016. Uh, most of it had been crossbred with Western, you know, polyhybrid stuff. That really, I think maybe one time that I see anything that was even, you know, pretty uh, natural looking, I guess, for lack of a better term. It really surprised me because Jamaica was always kind of known as, being like this really wild place, but there's a lot of cool genetics there, but you know, it's almost all contaminated with Western stuff now. Whereas when I was in Africa, especially like in remote parts of Zimbabwe, none of that stuff has seen any kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, ge uh, outside genetics because of the wars and the isolation and the sanctions and all the other stuff. There isn't a big export culture there, right? So they're not bringing in different genetics in order to, to crossbreed for, for export. So they're just growing what they like and what's, what's been growing there. So um, it's always kind of interesting, the different motivations of the different places. Um, if you think about it this way too, why is it that the biggest places in the world for the different genetic diversities that are kind of known for being these epicenters are Jamaica, which was a huge trade hub in the Caribbean, um, you know, Durban, which is a huge trade hub in, in Southern Africa, especially the, the anywhere where really where you had the, the um, what was the name of it? The East Indies, trading company or West Indies trading company or whatever it was back in the day. Um, anywhere, you know, in the 17, 1800s where you had a lot of this heavy trade, that's where you have a lot of the kind of meccas for these genetics. Morocco being another one that was a big trade hub. You know, all these different places that we kind of think of as being like the best places to go and source out genetics. Most of them were huge trade hubs. And back in the day, you know, from, you know, 1100 through, you know, the 1800s, you would keep, you know, hemp on your, your boat um, as part of your sail production uh, in case you have a shipwreck. You know, you can grow your own ropes and sails and things like that. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, other plants as well, uh, medicinally, that they would grow to keep as medicine on the plant on the boat. And that's why you have a lot of these different really cool land races in the specific regions that you have is because it was part of your boat standard boat repair kit for the better part of a thousand years. So if you did any kind of long sea travel, you brought pine trees. And you, which is why you have pine trees everywhere and also why they call everything that you can make into a mast a pine tree. There's lots of non-pine trees that are called pine trees is the common name. That's another reason for it. Um, you know, there's uh, all these different stuff, that, but that's the reason why you have that, you know, epicenters of, of genetics for medicinal plants uh, that we all enjoy is because of that, you know, boat repair kit type stuff. And then people kind of growing large volumes of that and kind of finding, you know, through pheno hunting, those, those better cultivars in those regions. That's interesting. And yeah, the medicinal plants have been transferred all around the world at this point, really. And some genetics, they might grow really well in one area, but they don't grow well at all. They actually can grow bad in other areas. Why is that? Well, a great example of this would be, you know, leaf width, right? So in, I just came back from living in Thailand for almost a year. Uh, the really narrow leaf varieties of plants grow much, much better uh, in Thailand or anywhere in the tropics, um, freak show would be another one that does extremely well because of the reduce, reduced leaf surface. Uh, in the hot sun, they don't get heated up as much, uh, and they don't have to sweat as much and drink as much water. Not sweat, but re you know, respirate through the stomata. Um, they're not losing as much water per day because they have a reduced surface area. So they can grow much easier and have a lot less heat stress. Whereas if you take a broadleaf, like a, a plant that came from a nor much more northern climate, um, you're going to have a, you know, a instant leaf burn. You're going to get sunburn. Those plants are going to have to work a lot harder to bring up more water because they're losing more water per day through the leaf structure. Uh, and it really can um, make a big difference. But that's the, you know, I guess the biggest reason why you would choose one or the other or, 
kind of the biggest things to look for when you're growing in the tropics versus growing in northern climates. In northern climates, it doesn't matter if it's narrow leaf or broad leaf anywhere near as much. If you're growing in the tropics, you know, if I take a, a you know, broad leaf, um, uh, you know, variety, it's just not going to do well. And we even saw saw that um, in a lot of the genetics we were testing there, you know, uh, anything that was super, super broadleaf, a lot of blueberry and things like that just fried in the sun um, because it just couldn't handle it. So definitely some. And uh, Freak Show really is one of the best ones. If you're going to grow in full sun in a really, really brutally hot climate, it really, really is one of the best. Durban would be another one that grows extremely well, does not care if it's 105 out. will do just fine, you know, in most cases. Okay. Now, can these genetics adapt to different climates? For example, could you take a broadleaf from the northern climate bring it down to the tropics and then have it grow naturally. Let's say, let's say it's out in the wild outside and over 20 years, let's say 20 years later, will that genetic adapt or will you just see poor growth for that 20 year period? Well, I think you definitely could have, you know, some level of adaptation if you could get them to finish off, you know, in a lot of cases, the plants don't make it all the way to harvest because of the, the heat and the stress and all the rest or, you know, past pressure. That's another one too. Like for instance, when I was in Thailand, you know, if you're in the marshier areas or the uh, rice fields, like where I was growing initially, um, those are all almost lemonine dominant completely uh, in terms of, of chemovar profile. Um, and that lemonine really does help get rid of those bugs that kind of like that environment more. Whereas in the mountains, you get more of the chocolates and the mangoes, some of the other, you know, funkier sandalwood um, type, type uh, terpene profiles. And that really ha- uh, is more adapted to like the white fly. And the other different pests that are up there, that's the plants that are surviving and not getting eaten by the bugs. So that, that plays a huge role in, in that terpene expression as well, as well as what's going to survive and not survive. You know, um, you know that's that's the other component to it aside from just the climate is that you know if it doesn't ha- if it has a you know, another one too. I was at a, a couple two different facilities and I've seen thrips specifically feeding on pineapple um, f- flavored varieties, eating all of the um, pestles off of the plants. So they eat just the pestles off, which is really weird. It's good if you don't want pollination, I guess. But uh, uh, they would just crawl up to the top, eat all the pestles, and then go back off the plant. It was the weirdest thing, but I've seen that on two separate occasions, specifically with pineapple-flavored varieties. So sometimes you even just get a, a pest that, that really cues in on one or two cultivars, and you just can't grow those particular cultivars because the pests are they're like magnets to them. So, you know, and other times too, hey. If those couple of plants are going to take all my bugs off of the rest of the plants, that's fine. I'll sacrifice those, and and we'll just you know sacrifice those to the Lord of Light at the end of the season, uh, like we do our ticks that we find on ourselves. Yeah, those sacrificial plants those can be uh, handy. I know some people grow plants specifically for that, you know, to try to attract pests to those so the other plants can grow well. I want to get deeper into the different areas you've personally grown in. Have you tried to like transfer genetics from one area to another and just seen a poor result or had a good result? Yeah, no, uh, every, everywhere I've go, we found ways to get the genetics there. I was the first legal person to import seeds to Zimbabwe. Um, and if we went to go pick up the seeds at the airport, and uh, I don't know if I told you this story or not, but uh, uh, we went to go pick up the seeds. I had all my paperwork from the red, you know, the health department, and they're like, you're here to pick up the seeds? Like, yeah, you're going to get arrested, like, whatever. Like, give us your paperwork. And he checked in and had the seal, right seals on it and stuff. So he goes up to his boss, comes back down. And he um, puts the box out with all the other boxes to kind of like test their dogs. This is because they're having fun with it now. That's once everything's on the up and up. And then they put take it out and they search around. And the dogs don't hit on the box. And they went from being really chummy to like really pissed off. Uh, so that was a that was a pretty scary few minutes until we could get the box and get out of the airport. But uh, that was that was really fun. But um, I've grown a lot of different places, and I would say that the only time we've really had a lot of negative issues was, well, partially was trying to get CBD and CBG cultivars to uh, um, grow in uh, the uh, the tropics. So those in particular were, were very difficult uh, because the heat and the natural higher manganese in Zimbabwe in particular um, has a really high base level of manganese in the soil. And if you have high manganese, that tends to really increase the... Um, expression of other particular compounds that you, you don't want if you're trying to grow for for you know eu compliant cultivars so um it, it kind of pushes that outside of the range so between that and the heat um you know it kind of causes you to always test hot so that was a big problem um 
that was really hard to kind of deal with. And at the end of the day, we really ended up selecting through through phenotypic and, and cultivar selection, finding the right ones for that. But it did take, you know, we got to get rid of about 40% of them because they just were always testing hot, you know, for, for the compliance that we had to grow for, for that particular customer. But um, that was the only time we really had a ton of problems with the cultivar specifically. I mean, you always have a percentage of what you're going to try to grow there. It's just going to hate that climate and just do crappy. And you just have, that's part of the game, right? You always, no matter what you're trying to do, there's always going to be a certain percentage of, of genetics that are just going to not like your particular grow method, no matter what you're doing. Um, so that's a big part of it. And then also, too, just making sure that you can kind of get the the biosecurity that you need in a lot of these facilities. They're used to growing traditionally, and that can be a big, big difficulty. But that was kind of the biggest problems. Now, in Jamaica, there um, nothing really gets that large. Very few of the genetics I've seen that were really growing and the hills, you know, get much above three or four feet tall. So you're not getting that much yield per plant. Um, so that was definitely another issue. And you know, you're going to go with much more denser planting. Um, I have some videos and stuff on it on my YouTube of, of what that looks like in the hills above uh, uh, out in Westmoreland. Um, I have a lot of good friends down there. I always love going down to the island uh, and uh, and hanging out and seeing a bunch of the traditional grows. I got lots of good homies down there and spend a lot of time down there. Now in um, Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe was really weird because we had a lot of, um, you know, traditional Rastafarian growers that just were growing gigantic trees, and they didn't care if it was taking six or eight months. In fact, the uh, best pining cultivars I've ever had were, and I still have, um, are from the hills of Ninyanga, uh, up kind of on the Mozambique um, Zimbabwe border. There's a ton of incredible genetics there that have totally uncontaminated still, um, and I think that kind of Sub-Saharan Africa is kind of the last place on Earth that, aside from maybe the Himalayas, that has a lot of untapped uh, genetics that haven't been contaminated yet. Um, it's the only place I've seen a lot of genetics was was in Zimbabwe and and you know on the border with Mozambique. There, um, hands down, like I don't think I saw anything that had any kind of Western structure to it. It was very very nice, you know, gigantic, you know, candelabras. Uh, um, and uh, what was interesting there is they brag about how many snakes you get on it. So, like, if you have a lot of snakes on your, your plants, the snakes will rub themselves on the resin glands to get rid of ticks and things like that because it makes them – they don't like the resin, right? So um, it's like a bragging rights if you have, like, uh, uh, lots of snakes in your grow, which I thought was a bit insane considering the species there. But, um, you know, you have to deal with green mambas and stuff. I'm, I'm not down for finding snakes in the in the grow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, I've never heard that before. That's uh, that's pretty wild. So you mentioned like a percent of genetics kind of not working out. For the average home grower, what would you say, like if they're ordering seeds online from say a different country or whatever, and they get it and they try to grow them within their home grow, indoor setup, what percentage of genetics would you say won't work out? I would just say, um, you know, avoid stuff that's from the tropics that gets large. That's going to be the number one thing. Like. Um, we recently had the temple tie that I did a, a collab with with, with Jordan um, on uh, on Growcast, and we released a bunch of those genetics. And the the biggest issue with those is they get you know 10 feet tall by week nine from germination. Where are you going to grow that in a tent, right? You need to hack the crap out of it to grow some of it. So avoid those types of cultivars. You know, a lot of your traditional trop equatorial land race stuff not going to really do well indoors or you know maybe start it indoors and then finish it outside kind of thing if you're going to do that um that's going to be your biggest you know challenge every you know otherwise just if you do decide to take them on just prune the living crap out of them make sure you know every four to, to eight days you are doing some type of light trim on it to keep them manageable in size or train them or you know, super crop them, or whatever it is you need to do to keep them inside your space. And also to remember, like most cultivars, with a few exceptions, kind of stop growing after about 24 to 30 days in terms of stretching once you flip their life cycle. So you know, keep in mind that plant might grow another you know two feet, three feet on some of these more equatorial strains that don't cue in quite as hard as some of the, the northern strains that are a little more used to to cueing in on that indoor 12-12. Um, you know, sometimes it can take them a little longer. And if you have, you know, you don't want that thing to be growing up into the lights and, and not haven't even flipped yet. You know, I've seen people do that too and just have to totally make like baskets out of their room, you know. And correct me if I'm wrong, but the genetics that are down in the tropics are more longer flowering strains, right? So looking at 11, 12, 13 plus weakers, 
sometimes down there. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And even longer, you know, I, there's definitely some cultivars I've seen both in Africa, especially in Africa, and to a lesser extent in Thailand, you know, that can take you, you know, four or five months of flower um, and a real, real long time to actually finish off. What also is interesting is a lot of the equatorial varieties have a minimum time too. So they have like, they're going to veg for two months or three months, no matter if you start them in 12, 12 or not. Like the, the temple tie that I have, um, absolutely, like it's going to get to 10 feet tall, no matter what, unless you are hacking the crap out of it, even if it's under 12, 12 or even 11, 11, um, you know, or 11, 13 rather, uh, it's still going to grow like, you know, absolute gangbusters and just ignore the fact that it's, you know, 50, 50, because it's the, the, it's strain grew up the whole time in the, you know, equator, right? So it's going to, it's used to that 12 hours and 12 hours. So it has kind of a minimum flowering time. Now, what's cool about it is some of them, once you're past that time, you can take cuts of them and they'll finish in, you know, nine to 12 weeks, which is not that much far off from a lot of your typical cultivars. You know, a lot of stuff now is eight weeks, but most stuff is really nine or 10. Um, if, if it's really good. So a lot of them can still fall into that range, but you're going to have to veg it for like, you know, four or five months before, you know, that mom, before you could really do anything with it in terms of quick fruit flowering. So that's another thing to take into account too with the equatorials. And you don't hear people talk about it as much. The other one that I've noticed too is with the equatorial stuff and to a lesser extent with the CBD lines as well, if you keep them under 24 hours of light, it causes herming and, and a lot of like hormonal problems where I'll get nanners on them if I have them under 24 hours of light for veg. But if I flip them and just do a 12, 12 or even 16 and eight, uh, I don't have any of those issues. Like the nanners stop and they never come back. I don't have any flowering problems with them throwing nanners. It's just that like stress of not sleeping. Um, I've noticed particularly in land race as well as CBD in particular seem to really, you know, heavily fall into that, um, that range where it's going to be a huge problem for you. I haven't heard that before. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, I've gotten myself into a little bit of hot water, I guess, just to say, kind of ignore. I don't say ignoring flowering time, but like I grow a whole a whole bunch of different cultivars in the same tent, and you know, I didn't really look at the flowering time too deeply on one of the cultivars. It was actually Hades thrown by Zaza Genetics. Shout out to Zaza, and uh, this one went for like twelve weeks. Everything else finished in eight nine, and so this one was just lagging beyond. And I knew something was up once I flipped to flowering and it was stretching and stretching and stretching. And then four weeks into it, it's like still grow. I'm like, what the heck? I'm like, oh, great. That At that point, I knew it was longer flowering. And so like, I thought it was a really good tip. What you mentioned is like, yeah, be aware of this stuff, right? Like plan around it because you could get your hands on some genetics and they may sound good. But if you're not looking at the flowering time, that could really throw your grow a little sideways. If you're someone like me who's growing a whole, a whole bunch of different plants in one grow space, well, you could have a whole bunch of plants finish first, then have this one plant lagging, could throw off your whole growth cycle, really. The other thing I would mention, too, is like if you have Zamal, which is the Reunion Island ran, land race, which very few people actually have, but I'm one of the people that managed to get my hands on some. Um, shout out the, the woman who gave me those. She knows who, she, who it was. Um, uh, the other t one that I've seen with the same trait is Freak Show in Thailand. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Kanatai, um, he has a really good um, uh, cultivar of Freak Show that does the same thing. But um, those two strains I've seen or heard of them in the case of the, the Zamal, uh, the Reunion Island Land Race, um, are actually can continue to grow post flower, right? So they'll just re veg and then flower again, re veg and flower again, and keep going back and forth between those two states. So you can grow them, you know kind of perennially without having to harvest the whole plant back, which is unique. There's very few plants in the whole gene pool that have that mutation. So I've only seen in person I've, the freak show do it, but I also know that a lot of people claim that Zamal does it as well. Um, but that's kind of something where, hey, if you're going to do that, you know, you have a big structured plant and you're growing it indoors, that's kind of a problem. If you're in the tropics and you can just let it grow in your yard all day, like that's not a problem, right? That's actually a benefit. So the, you know, kind of dialing in what, exactly what it is you want to do and you want from the plant and the size of the plants that you want for your particular indoor grow is going to be a big factor into what your you know selection is. Really good point. I want to circle back to pest control challenges. What pest control challenges have you faced growing in different areas? And do you have any tips for just general, I guess, IPM or, or pest control that the home growers can take away? Sure, yeah, there's <laughs> quite a bit to this one. So um, when I was in Jamaica, uh, for instance, in May, and Puerto Rico is the same way, anywhere in the Caribbean, anyone that's growing there knows this, um, you have butterfly season. 
So all the butterflies, basically, not all of them, but it feels like all of them, are like 60% of the butterfly species all have like lay eggs at, at once in April. So they all hatch out, and you have this swarm of butterflies that are all looking to lay eggs all over everything in May, in particular, and, and anywhere in the Caribbean. It's a huge pain in the butt. So, But if you know that that's coming, you can get ready in March and kind of keep BT on your plants in March and April and, and kind of head that off so that as soon as they're on the plants, there's something already working to get rid of them. So that's the kind of thing where once you've been through a place through a full year or even talking to local farmers, hey, what do I need to worry about in the next three months? What do I need to worry about in the next four months? And kind of learning from the locals. And what's oftentimes in the most of the world, it's the women that know all that stuff. It's not the men. The men are the ones off running, you know, fixing the tractors, driving, the, doing all the other stuff. It's the women in, in Africa and the Caribbean and many of these other places that are the ones actually working with the plants. So they're always the, you know, finding the old wise woman in town is the one you need to talk to 90% of the time in a lot of these different, you know, especially more far, far away places. If you really want to get the good agriculture information, we had 80% women working in Zimbabwe with us, and they were teaching us all kinds of cool stuff in terms of identification. Uh, another great trick for identifying, um, especially in a large scale for caterpillars, is go out at night with a black light. Um, the caterpillars and a lot of other insects will glow like little Christmas ornaments on your plants, and they're really easy to spot and scout. Um, that's why, especially in the summertime, I'll switch my work crews to in you know June through August to work at nighttime. You know, we'll start off at 1 or 2 a.m., and then finish up by like 11 or noon so that if it's going to be a hundred and you know, whatever in the middle of the day, we're finishing up right as it's getting hot, you know, same thing anywhere where it's going to be brutal. It's kind of the, the work schedule you have to do, but what's cool is it makes it super easy to start the day by scouting with black lights and uh, you know, looking around and seeing what, what the heck is going on in the field. Um, so that was a great way to kind of deal with a lot of those issues in Jamaica. Um, in Zimbabwe, we ran into some new issues that I hadn't run into before. So we had, large locusts uh, and grasshoppers that would come in and eat the center Cambrian layer of the plant. So they go up about a foot and a half, two feet high, eat all the bark off, and then the plants would just flop over, right? And it's like, what do you do against that? And there's, you know, we're getting overrun. And this all happened right when COVID hit the South Africa. So they immediately sealed all the borders with South Africa. And South Africa is where we, the only place we could import biocontrols from, right? So that we could use for resale in the Western markets because that was the goal was to export all of the flour. So we ha basically got cut off from all of our supply and I'm getting overrun by bugs. So I call up Chris Trump and I was like, hey, man, I'm kind of panicking. I don't know what to do right now. Can you give me some ideas on like something I can make? Because I am like cut off from the outside world. I can't import anything now because they have like a, you know, all the borders are shut now for bringing in anything because of COVID. And he told me about a method where he had, um, he did an IMO three to four. And in the bran, he had a bunch of weevils that had gotten into the bran and he inoculated it with this weevil brand, you know, infected brand. And what happened is the, the weevils got, uh, or, or flea beetles or whatever it was in there got, um, infected with the, uh, the fungi from the IMO that, that like to kill them, basically the wild equivalent of a Varia bassiana or Isaria fumis raceae, um, that or whatever it is, Cordyceps fumis raceae. Now I think they just changed the name of it. Um, they're always changing the name of the biocontrols just to confuse the crap out of the pest control people, I swear to uh, Anyways, um, that they were, looked like little popcorn kernels because they were covered in fungi. So he was like, hey, this works really good on the, the, the tr macadamia nut trees for getting rid of the weevils. You know, we, we've kind of been screwing around with it, but I haven't had anybody to really test it on like a bigger scale. So we went ahead and I, we paid a bunch of the kids like like a nickel for every 10 or 20 grasshoppers they could find. And we had all the little village kids running around getting all the grasshoppers they could into buckets for us. And um, we took that. We did a bunch of IMO collections with IPMO. So this is the recipe for this. And it's something I think anybody doing gardening uh, should really, you know, adopt this practice because it's really, really good. It works on a really wide range of insects, grasshoppers, um, blister beetles, Japanese beetles, leaf hoppers, um, stink bugs, like a lot of stuff that's really hard to treat normally. Um, caterpillars and, uh, and butterflies works really good on these guys too. Um, it will kill your bees though if you spray them directly with it. It will infect them. So it won't take out your hive, but if you spray them and directly apply it um, onto the bees, it will kill them. So just make sure that maybe you apply them in the evening when the bees have already roosted, if you, if you are keeping bees at home, just to be on the safe side. It's just a precaution on that. So 
uh, if you're familiar with IMO, um, and we'll go through it and assume that you aren't, first you're going to weigh about 700 grams of rice and put that into a bowl. Next, you're going to take 300 grams of your locally collected insects or purchased insect frass or go to your local pet shop or farm store and buy mealworms or crickets or some other local insect-ish. Or take a light bulb and put it above a bucket outside and just let all the local bugs fall into it and strain that and just try to get about 300 grams of insect frass or bugs. Alternatively, you can use crab meal or lobster meal if you have to, uh, if you're in a pinch. Next, you're going to mix those two together until you have a nice uh, insect-infused rice mix. Then you're going to cook that together, combined, uh, in, a, in a pot until it's about 80 to 85 percent finished with the rice, till it's a little bit stiff still, but not totally soft yet. Then you're going to take that finished cooked mix and you're going to put it into an open, um, uh, open weave basket that has a lot of holes in it and air can flow through it really well. Uh, and you're going to put a good four or five inches layer uh, in the bottom of that basket. Then you're going to take a piece of uh, open screen, uh, and it doesn't matter, any kind of screen will work. Or you can even just take a piece of string and weave it across the top. Um, you just need to make a cover for it that air can pass through, but you don't want to keep, let the local dogs or cats or squirrels or whatever else, the forest creatures into it. Um, okay, so now you have your basket that has a little screen on top. Now you're going to take your basket full of uh, your, your starter and you're going to put that out into the forest or a part of your property that has a lot of duff or leaf litter or, you know, a, an area where it's kind of naturally composting like you would in a forest. Um, the older the area that's, uh, and the healthier the area, the better. You know, uh, I like to do a good, you know, 10 to 20 collections at a time when I do this because you can combine all of them and kind of get the different microbial colonies from around the different area. Uh, you're going to set that basket out uh, into your forested area, and then you're going to put a cover on top. So not directly on top of the basket, but, you know, a good foot and a half, two feet above it, you're going to put a, a plastic bag or an old dog food bag or a trash bag, whatever you can. It just keeps the rain from falling onto the rice. So the rice doesn't get any more wet, right? You just want to have it kind of like damp but not soaking wet. Uh, then you're going to look around the forest and see if you can find any um, pieces of branches or anything that have a little um, uh, mycorrhizae on it and just drop two or three of those uh, or, or, you know, four or five if you want to into the top of your basket just, uh, you know, underneath the screen so that you do have a little bit of an inoculant uh, going on there. Now what's going to happen is uh, you're going to leave it out there for five days, you know, maybe six if it's a little bit cooler. If it's really hot, you can sometimes get away with four days, but usually five to six days is what it takes to do the collection. Now, what happens is you're collecting the natural fungi that feed on the rice, but also that feed on the insect corpses, basically the chitin-feeding chitin insects, um, so, or no, I'm sorry, uh, chitin-feeding fungi that feed on the insects. So um, you're kind of capturing all the local equivalents of Bavaria bassiana and Sicaria fumis racei and all these other biocontrols that you're making at home, but you're gathering whatever the local species is from your particular property or your particular region, so that when you apply this in your garden, you don't have to worry about, you know, contaminating the ground or worry about runoff or worry about if your kid's running through the garden while you're spraying or if your dog runs by you uh, or if it drinks from the container. It's no big deal. I can drink this stuff, which is cool. So now your, your basket's been out there for five days. You have your nice solid block of fungi. Uh, it's going to be white, maybe a little yellow, maybe a little bit of green in there. But for the most part, it should be white or most, you know, 80% plus white. You're going to take the basket back, uh, and then you're going to take all of your different fungal blocks that you have. Check them, make sure they're not all green. If it's all green, it's gone to trichoderma. Now, trichoderma is good in some cases. If you've got a fungal outbreak or whatever, you can culture that trichoderma and absolutely use that if you have, you know, 50, you know root rot or some other, you know, powdery mildew, something like that if you have to, but we're not trying to, to collect the tri trichoderma. Trichoderma can be a little too aggressive, and it can wipe out a lot of your other beneficials if you use too much of it. So uh, uh, if it's too much green, throw it away. Um, if it's not all green, it's all nice and white or white and yellow, take that, and you're going to weigh it all and put all the good collections into a bucket. You know, if you put out 20 of them, you should get at least, you know, seven or eight of them that are keepers. Um, you know, if you get more than that, then great. But, you know, don't feel bad if you only get one or two. That's perfectly fine. That's all you really need. So now you're going to weigh all of that collectively. So let's just say that, that we had uh, three kilograms of it. So we have 3,000 grams that we had uh, saved. Now we're going to weigh 3,000 grams of brown sugar, and we're going to combine that and mix it all together, and it's going to stabilize it by locking out the oxygen 
with all of that sugar. Um, and that's going to basically cause all of those microbes to go to like a spore form. So now we have a shelf-stabilized version that we can keep indefinitely uh, for, for use as our store, you know, basically shelf-stabilized pesticide that we've just made. Now when we're ready to brew that, we're going to take a big scoopful. Uh, if we're doing a smaller batch, you can do it a tablespoon for, you know, a, a grow tent size. If you're going to do a larger grow, you know, we were doing, a, a, you know, a four to six cups of it to do um, about 8,000 square feet of greenhouse. It doesn't take that much. You put that into a big paint strainer, you put an air stone or two in there, and you brew it up in your bucket or in your trash can and uh, uh, brew that up for 24 hours. Now, um, the IPMO should smell freakishly like wintergreen uh, when it finishes. It has this amazing pine wintergreen smell. I can't tell you why. I don't know what. I think it's the phenols that are in it, but um, it, it, it comes out this incredible like wintergreen smell. I'm, I'm not sure if that's universal. It's been universal with all the different places I've done it. You might have a version with your local biology that doesn't make it happen, but every time I've done it, that's what it smells like. So now you have this all good brew mix that's basically the rewoken up microbes that you went and collected that feed on chitin. And now when you apply that either directly to the root system through your fertigation, just strain it and, and apply it right to the roots. Uh, you can also foliar spray it onto the plants um, and it works to kill a huge wide range of insects, but also uh, instantly provides chitinase directly to the plants because those in, the fungi broke down that chitin from those insects inside of it. So you're also increasing the SAR response of the plant. So the plant's now boosting its immune system and its own defenses, and you're directly infecting the, the insects that are on the plant. So it's kind of like a double mechanism. You're boosting the plant's ability to fight the insects uh, and boosting its, its nutrient uptake of calcium uh, at the same time, which also helps with insect resistance. You're also um, directly infecting the, the, the pest insects, you know, by applying spores directly to their body, which then infect them and kill them and turns them into little white mummies, which is really, really cool. But um, it really is the best pesticide that I've seen or the best innovation I've seen in, in the organic world in a long time. And I think that everybody should be sharing this recipe, you know, with anybody they can, because it's a completely safe way to make a, a pesticide that really kicks the crap out of just a huge range of different insects. Um, and it's completely safe. You can drink the stuff and it's not, you might give you a stomach ache, but it's not going to kill you. You know, you're not going to have to go to the hospital. There, there's no kind of, you know, danger. That's awesome. I appreciate you sharing that recipe with us. We have uh, quite a few folks that take notes, you know, they've got their pen and pad ready and they're, they're taking notes on that. And really with this, this IMO recipe, it's natural farming technique. And there's so many different natural farming techniques out there. But yeah, again, thanks for sharing that one. I've, I'm sure you've probably saved quite a few gardens now in the future here because, uh, like you mentioned, that sounds like it's very strong and very uh, valuable for folks growing in different areas to kind of prevent pests or, or tackle pests. I've even had people um, use it on broad mites and have success as well, which surprised me because of typically things with six legs do not, or eight legs do not work with with fungal biocontrols. So, um, you know, again, I haven't had that response, but we have, a, I've had reports of people, two different people in Thailand using it to treat mites. So, um, you know, you never know what you're going to collect and, and what it's going to work for. But for the most part, it is amazing for most of your larger insects across the board. What about like storage tips and shelf life on it? So uh, the oldest one I've had is about a year and a half old and it was still pretty viable. Um, I haven't kept it longer than that just because, um, you know, it, it's kind of a newer tech that's only been around really since 2020. So most of the places we're at, we haven't, checked, you know, we've either blown through the whole batch that we made or, um, you know, some other thing where we just combined it with the next one. You can combine multiple months too, right? So I like to do a collection every month and then I'll combine this month, last month, and the next month, you know, from the previous year. So if I collect it in February, I'm going to put January and March's collections in the following year's uh, application and you just combine those three when you make it. So a scoop of this, a scoop of this, and a scoop of this, and that's going to give you the best uh, biodiversity. In fact, it's not that much different from, you know, who used to do this first was the Vikings. They would take the, the best soil from the end of the growth season or the, you know, right before harvest, put it into empty ram's horns and seal them with wax and then bury them below the frost line. And then when the spring would come and the ground would thaw, they would dig those up and spread them back out on the, on the ground. Well, they thought they were like, putting the garden spirits back onto the garden. Actually, what they were doing is just inoculating it with microbes that were kept below the frost line. Uh, and then now they're kind of just re-inoculating their garden with the best microbes from the, the previous year. So they had the same kind of idea. It was just a little bit different methodology. So a lot of this stuff is really much older than people realize. 
or we've been doing similar practices, we just kind of refine them, you know, significantly since uh, since their inception. That's super interesting. So getting into different areas, I want to get into garden setup and design. There's a lot of challenges that can be faced going from setup area in different countries or even just different areas across the U.S. What design challenges have you faced and kind of pivots that you've had to do growing in some areas versus others? Yeah, so the biggest one, hands down, across the board was power. Um, in Zimbabwe, we had power from Zesa from 11 p.m. till about 5.30 to 6 a.m., and that was it. The rest of the time, the power goes to the industrial zones, and you don't get power. So if you don't have power, you know, a generator or solar or, you know, some other way to power up whatever it is you need to power up that day, um, you are screwed. So uh, that was a huge part of it, uh, you're setting up all that infrastructure, usually solar or, or generators just to get, get by in the beginning. And then setting up solar pumps for long-term irrigation um, is really just almost required once you get into most of the remote areas. Um, you know, setting them all up to drip lines and then also on a, on a rotation schedule. So like this field gets flooded on Mondays, this field gets flooded on Tuesdays, this field gets flooded on Wednesdays, and then repeat again, you know, kind of thing. So um, that type of stuff is really, you know, uh, indexing valves would be another one where we're able to do large volumes of stuff with one or two pieces of equipment because it's switching between four separate large zones or eight separate large zones. Um, the one thing I would say with indexing valves is that make sure you're checking them daily or almost daily because if one of those fails, you know, you're losing thousands of plants if that if that breaks. And we had that happen at one facility in Jamaica um, that I was working with University of Technology at Kingston, they had one that failed and it wiped out, you know, three of the four rows of plants that they had um, because they weren't checking it regularly on the maintenance. Once it was set up, they, the guy just signed off that he checked it and wasn't actually checking it. So that's another thing is uh, making sure people are actually doing it and finding out, like, who in your local area is actually reliable um, that you can count on, you know, is another hard, big thing. But the biggest thing, too, is just drip lines. Drip lines are the best way to do large scale, you know, outdoor uh, on any kind because you're not going to get any of that evaporative water loss, um, and they're pretty easy to set up everywhere in the world. You can find the drip line irrigation kits. You know, doesn't matter if you're as far away as Zimbabwe um, or some of the other areas that maybe don't have quite as much income uh, in the world. Uh, um, you can find drip line kits at an industrial scale pretty cheaply anywhere. So, um, and the next thing would be properly sourcing fertilizers and, and pesticides in most of the rest of the world is a lesson in insanity. Um, you really have to hunt and peck and often just import them from local countries nearby. Um, you know, in the case of Zimbabwe, we had to import everything from Kenya or, Zimb or South Africa because they're the only two places that have biocontrols that we can get either beneficial insects or, you know, all your standard, you know, things like Bavaria Bassiana and so on and so forth aren't really that much into the rest of the world yet with the exception of southeast asia thailand was an exception where thailand actually has a bunch of biocontrols that we don't even have here yet that i wish we i wish i had we have a 10 in one which is like a or five in one uh, that's b militaris and uh varia bassiana seraphimus triase metarizium and another one uh, all combined into one in one application and that stuff kicks butt like like that's like your especially for thrips that like nukes the crap out of your thrips, man. It just wipes them out. Um, and that was really a good saving grace for us for thrips. But um, that's another thing too. In the U S you can't do combined um, biocontrols, right? So they don't, they can't legally sell a product that has Bavaria bassiana and metarizium in it as a combined application. They have to all be individual active ingredients because of the pest control laws in the United States. Whereas in Thailand, you can have two, three, four, five biocontrols in one separate powder. You put it in the water and mix it up and, and run with it. So, um, that would be another big thing that's, that's different is that sometimes, at least in Southeast Asia, it's a little easier for, for the pesticide stuff to find what you want. But, you know, in Zimbabwe, you could buy Paraquat at the hardware store, and it's sitting right next to the ammonium nitrate and the barrel, barrels of peroxide, which, you know, is not a very good place to store all that stuff. Uh, certainly not in the open where people are smoking cigarettes. So uh, it is, uh, uh, you know, you see some stuff where you're like, oh, my brain hurts. And I this shouldn't be anywhere near this place right now, but um, you know that that's honestly the probably the biggest challenge is power and then sourcing stuff can be just if you aren't used to, to to and the hardest part of sourcing is just finding whatever the local thing is like in Zimbabwe it's Shopee and Lazada uh, in Africa it's kind of whatever 
ag website that you could find. Um, so that a lot of it is just spending hours searching for all your list of equipment. Once you have your list of equipment, as far as sourcing and, and finding someone that can deliver it within a reasonable time, too, that could be another big problem, depending on where you are. I want to get deeper into genetic diversity, just a little bit more here. Talking about modern techniques, genetic engineering, selective breeding, what role does that play in shaping the genetic diversity of plants? Well, as far as um, selective breeding, I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why the United States is kind of the king of the medical plant world is because we, you know, fought the man one closet at a time. You know, we had at any one point, you know, 60 to 80,000 different breeding programs going in the U.S. at any one or more, right, to supply. It, it's always was comical to me when you hear some of these big MSO and corporate guys going, well, we, there's not enough small producers around to, to, to supply the country. Who do you think supplied the country for the last 80 years, right? Like, that's a comical thing to say. So I think, but that's why you have, you know, the U.S. is the leader on that genetically is because we did have so many different unique programs and every single breeder had a different thing in mind. Each one was chasing something different. Some had a medical problem. Some were chasing hype stuff. Some were chasing stuff that looked good. Some just happened to get lucky and find a, a gem in the rough and, and ran with it. You know, there's plenty of stories with that. You know, Gorilla Glue was was an accident plant. You know, there's plenty of others out there that, you know, were just something accidentally got pollinated and ended up producing a gem, you know. So there's even lots of stuff that was accidental um, and, and people didn't. So I think that's really the, the biggest thing that's driving. Now, nowadays, you have a lot of this genetic marker-assisted stuff and things like that. Um, you know, there's definitely some companies not that long ago that were screaming about, uh, 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 what was it, new, outrageous new strains. It's funny how the company that said that, the CEO got fired, and we've yet to see any of those outrageous new strains. Um, I know that GW Pharma has a few genetically patented strains that they've never released to the public, that they're internal, that I've heard from Ethan, talking to Ethan Russo. But there's not a lot of people doing the GMO stuff yet, at least not publicly. And to be honest with you, too, a lot of the market does not want GMOs. Like 80% of the cannabis market are people that already don't like GMOs, right? So it's kind of a, why would you make something for a comp for a market that doesn't want that thing, right? I, there's certainly some, on the large scale commercial side, I think, you know, things like triploids or, or GMO stuff that's not going to be able to be pollinated is cool when you just want to grow a field for biomass, right? And not have any males or have your neighbor, neighbor be able to do his own breeding program and not screw up your stuff, or have hemp growing, you know, seed hemp or fiber hemp where they're not pulling males, um, and then you don't have to worry about it for your home grow. I think that's, or not home grow, but like for your other nearby commercial grow. I think that is viability for that type of stuff. But personally, I'm, I'm not, I'm not for GMOs or anything like that. I also think that there's a potential too with autoflowers being kind of used in that way with, um, and I've talked about this a long time ago with autos being used to kind of control the market. If you have triploids and autos being like the vast majority of what's available to home growers, they have to buy each time. Once we have federal legalization, it means the feds can get their tax money each time. So I could see them doing some kind of law where, and again, this is being doomsday-ish, but where the feds require those to be the only seeds sold so that they can control the market, which, you know, that would uh, piss a lot of people off, including me. Um, and it's something that is scummy enough I could see them trying to do. Hopefully I didn't give them any ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so triploids generally are kind of against that, huh? No, I mean, a lot of great strains are triploids, but I mean, at the end of the day, if you're selling seeds and people can't breed with them, that's kind of, uh, you're kind of ending the line. You know, you're a lot of us that are in the community happen to, to, and a lot of breeders what are breeders supposed to work with? You know, if you're a new breeder just getting into the game, you know, you're not somebody that's been around for a long time. You don't have 2,000 plus different cultivars in your, your selection like I do or a lot of other people do that have been doing this a long time. You know, how are you supposed to build a pool of genetics to start working with to, to, to have the colors you need to paint your picture, right? Like, you got to have some different stuff so you can be like, oh, I like the trait from this one. I like the trait of this one. I bet they'd be even better if I combined them this way, right? Like, that's what all of us have, have experienced when we're doing breeding. And by closing that door, it takes away a lot of the fun of, of actually just growing the plant. So, like, again, it's great for commercial production. I think it definitely has a place in the market, but I wouldn't buy a 10-pack, you know, put it that way. I got my hands on uh, the Donuts Triploid by Humboldt, and uh, I haven't planted them yet. I figured I'd plant them and try them out, see, uh, see what happens there. But, yeah, I mean, from what I'm hearing, it seems like there's more... I don't know if I should even say this, but it seems like more cons than pros. I feel like 
it's never going to kind of overrun the whole market. I feel like femmes are always going to be the most popular, right? Everyone, the traditional home grower is just going to want femme and they're going to want to be able to create their own seeds. And you can't really do that with triploids. So I don't foresee triploids kind of, kind of overrunning everything. And then like regs and fems kind of being outdated or obsolete. But yeah, it's kind of interesting. It's kind of coming onto the scene here and it's becoming pretty popular out of nowhere. My, my other question is, is that what are the negative impacts of that triploid genetic? Like, does it make it weaker to PM? Does it make it weaker to some uh, environmental factor or insect that suddenly, it, you know, because of that mutation, it, it's not able to express something that it needs to defend itself? Like, that's that's another thing I always think about with this is you might make a great plant, but if, you know, you breathe on it wrong and it gets botrytis, uh, it's not that great of a plant, right? So, so that's the other stuff I worry about is, uh, you know, a lot of this polyhybrid stuff, the moment I take it and put it outside, just gets wrecked. Like, like a lot of the super, super polyhybrid stuff did not do well in Thailand. It just got mauled. Like, like especially when we're growing in the rice paddies, it needs to be, have some level of, of mold resistance, especially, you know, or it's just going to not do well. So, um, you know, it, you can solve a lot of that with things like IMO applications and boosting the plants, but you can only, that only works so far where before, you know, just nature is going to take its course too, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. I said, I guess it's not really surprising in a way, because um, yeah, I mean, this, this whole episode has really been about growing plants in different areas, and that's a good a good example of a plant that doesn't grow well, grows well in one area, but doesn't grow well in another. Well, think of it too. Like, why do you have different genetic cultivars in different regions? Is because the genes are being triggered in the plant's immune system to defend itself for those different things that increase those different secondary metabolites that we call flavonoids and terpenes and other compounds in the plant. So if those genes aren't being expressed over and over again in an indoor grow where they're kept sterilized, especially if it's like a, a rock wool grow where they're all super sterilized, how, how are those genes going to get activated? That's why you see like hydro rock wool stuff. It's hard to get above 3% terpenes for most people unless you're really doing microbial inoculations. If you hit, take those same cultivars, drop them in living soil or aquaponics, and they have that gene activation of all those different microbes, you're going to start to hit, you know, 4, 5, 6% terpenes. Uh, on those, you know, out of those same exact cultivars, because those genes are being turned on suddenly. So um, that's the re- number one reason why you need to get microbial biodiversity in your root system is to turn those genes on and get that terpene expression on. That's going to boost all, not only the plant's immune system, but also you know your yields and the and the potency of your, your medicinal crops, or even your lettuce and tomatoes. You know you want to have good flavor in your lettuce and tomatoes, or cucumbers, or, or eggplant. You better have a good biological diversity. It's why, for instance, a, a living soil a lettuce out of your backyard tastes better than the hydro crap at the grocery store because all of those genes are being turned on inside the plant that make those flavonoids. And without that, you're, you, you don't have that gene expression. That's why if you continually breed something in a sterile environment, it's going to lose the ability to turn those genes on because why is it going to waste the energy to, to, to make those compounds anymore or to even try to turn those genes on? when it never has to deal with it and neither did its grandparents or, you know, its great grandparents. It has a long-term, you know, evolutionary lineage where it's not having to deal with that stuff. So it kind of makes for weaker strains that are, especially powdery mildew seems to be like the number one thing that these ultra poly hybrids seem to be just really weak to when you put them outdoors or, you know, certain insect stuff they just have no resistance to because again, there's, there's no immune system to these plants. And I think people kind of forget that part of it. Those are really good points there. Kind of reminds me of you hear a lot of people talking about genetic drift. Can you talk about what genetic drift is and how it's really impacted plants these days? Sure. So genetic drift would be either from super hybridizing something, especially with itself, or having just really old moms. You know, um, remember that the plant's kind of constantly producing new tissue, and it's again constantly turning those immune system genes off and on, like we just talked about. So. Uh, if you have the mom that's grown in one kind of condition and then the flowering conditions are much more different, it's, it's going to have a hard time with that. And also, too, as plants age, you know, they're going to have some genetic mutation just from the fact that the plant's just living longer, right? Um, the other thing that people forget with cannabis is cannabis has some issues, too, when you grow it too long because it wants to um, save its local genetic population. So uh, it's going to try to hermaphrodite on you once it hits a certain age because that's built into the genes of the plant. The same reason why like root bound plants will trigger for the same thing because uh, in the wild right you have a plant and it grows and grows and grows it doesn't get pollinated doesn't get pollinated doesn't get pollinated and now it gets a cold snap or it gets some kind of like weather condition that's going to potentially kill the plant in the near future 
it's going to immediately try to produce that female pollen so we can produce female plants so that it can die and next year its daughters can come back and try to be pollinated by outside genetics to preserve that local population. The plants evolved to do that. When it evolved in the steppes of, of Mongolia and Tibet, which is where it's from originally, um, it, it evolved that mechanism so that it didn't go extinct in its local region. And, and when you think about it evolutionarily, like, that makes a lot of sense for it to work, function that way, right? Uh, and, and, and evolutionarily, it, it's a big advantage. But when you're trying to veg it and keep it <laughs> from flipping, that's a problem because you know there is a maximum life on the plants, usually about a year and a half, two years, where they're just going to start to to get real weird on you. And some of those genes for that final end of life thing are starting to turn on because it's been alive too long or maybe it's stressed it out too much or it's root bound after that or whatever the, the pressure point is, but that something's going to eventually trigger those genes, you know, if you don't restart it and take new clones. But even if you clone it, that clone's not going to be exactly the same as that mother was. It's going to be close, but it's going to have a few mutations that are different or a few adaptations, phenotypic adaptations, that are going to be slightly different from that mother. And over time, those start to build up and can cause issues. The other thing I see a lot in really old ones, and people often attribute it to genetic drift, but usually it's not. It's actually viral infection. Is is um, you know particularly mosaic virus and some of these others where if the plant is healthy, it's not going to have any kind of negative impact, right? Um, you know, uh, as long as it's getting all of it needs and the immune system is kept healthy. But as the plant gets older and older, it's less able to fight that. So you get this gradual increase in viral load until it hits that critical point, and now it's expressing in the leaves suddenly. Um, you see this sometimes, too, with HLVD. HLVD in many cultivars will perfectly be fine if it's only detectable in the root system. It's not going to affect the yields of the flower. In fact, Kevin McKernan has a wonderful white paper on this specific problem, um, whereas if the plant gets aged and that viral load gets up and up and up, now it's going to start to cause that, that leaf mutation and the upper part plant mutation and things like that as well. So that's, a, that's how, like for instance, the hop industry has, has slowly gotten rid of uh, HLVD was they didn't ever got rid of HLVD completely. What they did was they got rid of all the cultivars that actually have problems with it. So it can remain latent in the plant, but not have yield effects or, or negative yield impact. So that, you know, uh, the industry is going to have to stop, you know, with this idea that they're ever going to get rid of it. it. It can be latent in cucumbers and tomatoes and corn, right? How are you going to get rid of that? You can't. And it's pollen spread. So, you could have a leaf hopper go bite the guy's corn and then reaffect your plants, right? That you just spent all this lab work on. It's a, it's a, it's an impossible task. You can't eliminate it, right? The hemp, the hops industry would have eliminated it a long time ago. They spent 200 years on this problem and they still haven't figured it out, right? So we're not, <laughs> and they spent a lot of money. As beer guys have as much money as the, the, the medicinal plant growers do in terms of investment to protect their plants. So, you know, again, if, if companies like Unibrew can't solve this, you know, we're not going to do anything magically different overnight that's going to suddenly do it. So um, this is, an, you know, another big issue where especially, you know, I can go into most grow rooms and find at least one or two viral infected plants where people don't even realize it, especially mosaic virus where they're, or, or um, I've seen a lot in the last couple of years on outdoor plants, beet um, leaf curl virus or bean leaf curl virus, where it causes the really corkscrewing and stuff like that, um, where, you know, again, it might not show in the beginning, but after the plants hit six or eight months, suddenly it starts to rage out because, that viral load has just hit that critical point where now it's going to express in the leaf tissue. So that's another one where, you know, you don't see as much when you have big genetic gene pool diversities, you don't have as much problems. Um, whereas with the small polyhybrid stuff you do. Yeah. Viruses, viroid, that's a whole nother topic on its own. We could do a whole episode on that. It's kind of scary. You know, I mean, I, I only imagine how many home grows are impacted without the actual grower even knowing that they're impacted by it. They think it's a deficiency. Instead, it's actually a virus or a viroid that's causing harm to their plants, and they're just <laughs> treading on water, basically, trying to keep their head above water for that for that growth. So, yeah, crazy stuff. And I'm sure there's going to be a lot more information coming out in the future in regards to that one. I did have a follow-up question in regards to the mother plants. Now, you touched upon how, over time, these plants are going to be more likely to harm, right? So, keeping mother plants around, I think you mentioned one and a half to two years to keep the mother plant around. Is that the longest that you suggest to keeping mother plants around? Yeah, I mean, ideally, if you can swap them every six months to a year and restart them, that's that's even better. Um, but yeah, I mean, the longest I would try to keep something would be about a year and a half to two years. After that, the likelihood of you not having problems is, is pretty low. You know, you're going to have some kind of issue at that point. Um, also, size, you know, how... 
<laughs> if you're growing something that long, even if you're hacking the crap out of it every 10 days, it's going to be a huge structure to it at that point, and it just gets unmanageable, and it's a pain to take new cuts because you get on a ladder, and it just it's just not safe for it, especially when you get to bigger time. You're, you're just working on that many hours. You're going to have an accident. So um, it's much better to just restart them before they get too large from a safety standpoint. But also from just a genetic drift standpoint, you're going to have those issues with uh, the plants that are that are too old. And you're talking restart from seed, right? You're not saying grow the mother plant for two years, take a clone from it, and then that clone is your new mother plant. You could in theory, you can do that as long as you kept them healthy. Yeah. Okay. The, again, the, the reasons why you end up having problems biggest ones is root bound, you know, being root bound, um, heat stress or, or infection or insect damage, you know, any kind of uh, light, you know, light leaks or, or anything like that. As long as you don't have those types of things, um, you know, you can kind of get away with rebooting them for the most part. Again, you can only do that once or twice though, before you're going to still, plants can have a maximum age before it's just, again, going to start having problems. They just get, there's, there's genetics, the plant's not designed to live that long. So you're kind of doing a bunch of stuff where it's, it's, starts to make errors in its copies when it's making new tissue and things like that. Same way that we do. You know, that's why humans get cancer. We start to have errors in our, our system as we get older. It's why older people have more than, than younger people, for instance. So it's the same kind of problem. Got it. So what other tips do you have for growing genetics in different climates? Number one thing would just be, you know, narrow leaves in hot climates and, and wider leaves in, in colder climates would be kind of the, the baseline for that. Um, try not to grow anything super polyhybrid in an outdoor environment, period. Or if you do, don't count your farm on it. Um, I know the first year that runts came out, um, I watched people plant, you know, an unseen amount of that in Oklahoma. And I don't know a single person aside from us that actually harvested it <laughs> um, because all of it rotted. You know, if you're going to grow a really dense um, flowered structured plant uh, in uh, somewhere where it's high humidity, good luck. You better put a heck of a you know, probiotic uh, regimen on that plant, you're going to have major issues. Um, really is a, a, a huge factor when you're choosing that. You know, grow something that's more open and airy with a less of a tight structure, something that's larger and branchier in those more humid environments. Um, making sure you're using IMO and IPMO um, for your stuff. Simply doing the lactobacillus IMO and IPMO from curing natural farming or any kind of large-scale outdoor is going to make your life so much easier. The plants are going to be much more naturally resistant to a wide range of different pests and pathogen issues. Um, it really is going to be your, your best way to kind of make things go as smooth as possible. I can't imagine growing anything at scale anymore without, you know, different natural farming methodologies just because of how much uh, of a good job it does at preventing, you know, botrytis, powdery mildew, um, and a lot of the other heavier insect problems. Septoria would be another one where, you know, I've seen people have huge fields of septoria uh, and wipe them out, but I've also saved a lot of them too by treating the lactobacillus, and then an IMO inoculations. Um, you don't have a store-bought product. You can go to treat septoria easily, especially once that plant's heavily infected. That's going to reverse that. You can treat it with trichoderma or some of the other ones if you catch it early on. But traditionally, the agricultural industry will tell you to throw that soil away even, right? We can treat that in three weeks, right? So this is kind of stuff where the natural solution actually works much better than the chemical one. So once you start to learn some of that stuff, it, you, your life will get a lot easier. Um, when it comes to the, the, especially the bigger scale stuff, but even at the home scale for, for tent growers, um, it's just going to make sure you don't have to go buy those expensive inputs uh, at the shop. You know, you can at least get half of your or two thirds of your pest control stuff just from your own backyard, which is great. There's some really, really good tips, man. This whole talk has really opened up my mind quite a bit and made me realize that the amount of knowledge I have compared to what you can learn growing in different areas. I mean, it's just, it's pretty much endless. I think we're all going to be learning about this plant for the rest of our life, right? There's always more to learn. There's things that we haven't uncovered yet, and it's just, it makes things so exciting and so fun. Thanks for coming on today. Really appreciate it. Can you tell the listeners how they can find you? And is there anything upcoming in the future that you want to talk about? Sure, yeah. Um, you guys can find me anytime over at the Growing With Fishes podcast on all platforms. Um, we cover a wide range of different aquaponic, living soil, and medicinal plant topics over there. Um, you can also find me uh, over on um, Copyleft Cultivars. I'm on the board of Copyleft Cultivars as well. We have a, a really awesome new um, uh, natural farming AI bot that we're releasing uh, uh, as well. You can check that out and any other st content that we've done on that over at copyleftcultivars.com. And, um, uh, yeah, if anyone wants to check out any of my school and stuff, uh, I have a bunch of online courses as well over at apmjclass.com. So, um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, always a pleasure. Uh, 
Also, uh, if you want to like listen to more of uh, Mr. Groen and I, uh, he was over on my show the other day, so uh, not too long ago. So be sure to check it out and listen to uh, uh, the reverse where I interview him. So if you enjoyed this episode. Yeah, it's been a couple times now that I've been on your show. I appreciate you having me on. And I'll definitely have a link to your channel down in the YouTube description section below. And I always do as a pinned comment as well. So folks can easily get to your channel. And uh, yeah, let us know any questions that you have down in the comments section. I love to read through the questions. And if we get enough questions, maybe we can get another episode with you to come on here and answer some of those questions. Because you have a lot of real in-depth knowledge, um, not just on genetic diversity, growing plants in different areas. But I mean, we had that episode on aquaponics, which was just loaded with information. You grow organically, do a lot of natural farming. So there's so many different areas we can go in. Definitely leave your questions down in the comments section below. Stephen, thank you so much again for coming on. This has been awesome. And I uh, hope you enjoy the rest of your night. Yeah, thank you so much again for having me on. And uh, it's a pleasure as always. Thanks. Thank you. Peace out, everyone. Catch you in the next episode.